I didn't expect too many people to show up today, so I'm very gratified that the audience is so full. I'm going to actually talk about a problem that has exercised people for thousands of years. Um, there have been many speculations about planets. Uh, we can go back to Epicurus, for example, who speculated about the, uh, the existence of worlds beyond what we knew, beyond the planets that were known. Of course, uh, this subject is rather fraught with danger. He died very painfully. Galileo, of course, is famously known for having discovered moons around Jupiter. This was uh, considered um, uh, apostasy and heresy. And of course, he was imprisoned until he died uh, for the, something associated with this. So it's, he also suffered uh, for his beliefs. Of course, uh, the martyr for the subject is Giordano Bruno, who uh, said that there are countless suns and countless Earths, and this didn't meet with the, uh, with the approval by the hierarchy, and he was burned at the stake. So I, I enter the subject with a little bit of trepidation, given the history, uh, and hope that we've uh, evolved at least a tad beyond um, uh, our ancestors. We'll see whether that's actually true. There is going to be some science in this talk. So I warn you ahead of time, there will be a few numbers, but not many. I'm going to try to communicate the excitement in the subject. And this subject, as David says, is exploding. We didn't know of any planets outside the solar system until 1992. We were confined to uh, knowledge of just the planets, Neptune and Uranus and uh, Saturn and Jupiter, etc. And um, for many, many uh, years, but in the last 15 years, we've discovered 500 planets outside the solar system. Most of them are giants, but they're obviously accompanied by many, many Earths. And one of the goals of the subject is to discover these Earths, particularly Earths like our own planet, hence the name. People would like to know whether there are planets out there that could house life. And so that's the holy grail for the subject. But stepping stones along the way, are the characterization of the larger objects that are easier to see, like Jupiters, maybe even Neptunes, etc. And we're progressing down to the smaller scales. And that's the theme of my life today. I'll just summarize very quickly that despite the fact that we had no knowledge just 10 or 15 years ago about these objects, we now know of, as I say, 500 mostly giant planets. We've seen compositions in their atmospheres. We've seen water, sodium, carbon monoxide, we're learning about the temperatures of these atmospheres. We're learning about their sizes. We've discovered what are called super-Earths, which are getting down to the mass of Earth, but not quite there yet. Many, many Neptunes, which are intermediate in size between the Earth and Jupiter. Um, we found three planets around pulse, uh, a pulsar, a radio pulsar, quite bizarre, very exotic and dangerous environment. And very recently, we've actually, again, started to touch on Earth mass objects with Earth, size, with Earth sizes. And so that's going to frame my, my lecture. And so let me proceed. Of course, uh, the solar system is something you learn about in grade school from the terrestrial planets, the uh, Earth-like planets, Venus, Mercury, Mars, and the Earth. The Earth, you could say, is a, has a size one. It's the radius of the Earth. The Jupiter is 10 times that size, just keep that in mind, and it has 300 times the mass. So big things are easier to see and to measure, small things are hard. And so we're tripping over the big ones as we race towards the smaller ones. Now, just uh, to give a general scale of things, the sun might be of this size, here's Jupiter, Saturn, and then the rest of the planets, here's uh, Uranus and Neptune. Here is Jupiter uh, and, and Saturn, and here the smaller planets as well, just to give you a sense of the relative scales. Now, in anticipation of whatever questions there may be about Pluto and being a planet, I, I call your attention to this little movie. The red objects here are so-called Kuiper Belt objects. There are planets orbiting around on these circles. There are comets on here as well. Where is Pluto? Can you find Pluto on here? Pluto is there, that thing right there. The reason people want to demote it is because Pluto has many, many cousins. Every one of those red things is a Pluto. We just recently discovered them. So why should Pluto be special? And that's, therein hangs the tale. 
in anticipation of a question I was no doubt going to get. Now, astronomers are going to are, are very, very creative. They can think of lots of ways of doing things. Uh, don't worry, I'm not going to follow every single branch on this tree, but I'm going to focus on a few techniques than what we've actually discovered and try to wrap up. Now, there's a radial velocity technique. A planet orbiting a star will have a response, uh, will force the star itself to respond in kind. The planet's over here, the star's over here. The planet orbits, the star has to go over there. The center of mass doesn't move. So they orbit around the common center of mass. If that's the case, then the star is wobbling in response to the planet. And sometimes the star is coming towards you, sometimes the star is going away from you. And just like a radar gun, when something goes towards you, there's a Doppler shift. Just like the train um, whistle, uh, the frequency goes up when the train's coming towards you and it goes down when it goes away. And so from that variation in the frequency of the light from the star, due to the presence of a planet, the wobble, the Doppler shift, the radar gun effect, you can actually measure the mass of the planet without seeing it. And so this is the, what I'm referring to, the star moves around, the planet moves around, and this is the basic idea. When the star is moving towards, it's blue shifted, so you get uh, shorter wavelengths, and then red shifted, blue shifted, and this variation is what people saw first. And we've seen many planets by this technique. It's not getting an image. That's going to be tough, a uh, hundred years or so. But we can see the indirect signatures and some direct signatures with the artful techniques that astronomers have put together. And this is a, a radial velocity curve. This is just the velocity you see, the radar gun speed, and it just oscillates. That's the star oscillating in its orbit around the common center of mass in response to the planet. So you see there's an indirect signature of the planet in the star's spectrum. There's another technique. It's the same thing in some sense. The star, again, wobbles around the common center of mass. And if you can watch the star, just look at it, you could see that wobble. Forget about the velocities, you actually see the displacement and the position of the star. Now, that displacement is really small. You've seen this before. It's the same thing. You can see how it's displaced. If you're very far from the star and the planet, very, way down there, the dis displacement as it wobbles here is, is, is incredibly small. This is what the sun does in response to Jupiter and Saturn. There's the sun. Now, this is in so-called arc seconds. Here's numbers now. Don't worry. The moon's size is half a degree, OK? You know about degrees. An arc second is one ten thousandth of that. I'm, I'm rounding. And this is a thousand times smaller. This is hard to do. This is hard to do. But this is how, this is the trajectory that would be followed. You see it at about 10 parsecs or 33 light years away. That's the wobble you would see. And that wobble is a direct signature of the presence of planets. The wobble isn't simple here. Anybody know why? Because there's more than one planet. <laughs> so you've got to deconvolve that. But it's done. And there's a, a mission that is being planned to do so-called interferometry in space, the SIM mission. And don't worry about the details here that might be able to see that 1,000th of one arc second of, of, uh, of angular displacement. That would be amazing. And that's the type of displacement that an Earth would also uh, uh, force a nearby star like the Sun to execute. Now, there's another technique which is j directly out of the pages of Einstein. It's called microlensing. If you have a planet that's orbiting the star, and you're looking at that star, Okay. It could be that another star passes within your field of view, right across that back, background star. If it does, the light from the background star is bent by the light, by the star, the mass of the star that's going in front. It's just like a lens. And that bending, not only, uh, there's not only bending, but there's light amplification. And so what you get is a curve that looks like this. This is the magnification. One is no magnification. 10 is factor of 10 brighter. You get things like that. We've seen many of these. But what happens if you see something like that? That means you're seeing not just the star. There's a planet around that star. 
And we found 17 planets this way. There's another technique, and I'm going to focus a fair amount on this because it gives us the most information. It's a so-called transit technique. And transits are nothing new in astronomy. I'll just summarize here, and I'll show why they're not new. Here's the star. Here's a planet in its orbit. If the orbit is around like this, and we're over there, this planet does not get in front of the star. But if it's orbiting in the plane of your observation, then it goes in front of the star. And if it does that, you look at the star, its light goes like this. It's steady, and then it drops down. If the planet is large, the drop is big. And so by the, measure, by the drop, you can measure the size of the planet. Pretty good. The radial velocity technique, that Doppler radar gun technique, will give you the mass. If you get mass and radius, you can do some science. And for 70 of these objects, we've been able to do that. Not bad. Now, this is the primary transit when the star is occulted by the planet. The planet, of course, will go behind the star, and that's called secondary transit. And in each phase, we get interesting information, which I'll discuss. Now, this is a real picture of Venus in 1882 transiting the sun. I don't have a movie, unfortunately. They didn't. Although there, it might have been possible then. But you can see how small it is. It's not going to make the stellar light blink much. So that blink is going to be very small. So it's something the size of Venus, which is like the size of the Earth, isn't going to give a big signature. You're going to have to have a good telescope, usually in space. We have them. I'm going to talk a little bit about that. Now, of course, an earlier transit of Venus is associated with Captain Cook's voyage. And, and he also, everything associated with planets leads bad, you know, goes badly. He, he was murdered, of course, in this expedition. But that's, that's, a, that's a different lecture. So this is what's happening. Planet goes across the star, goes on. And this is what happens to the light curve. And this is the best light curve, one of the best light curves we've been able to get. I'm going to call your attention to a few things. This was taken with the Hubble Space Telescope. Nothing, nothing, nothing. Planet gets in the way. From the shape, we can learn a lot about the planet and something about the star. Um, but look at that number, 1 to 0.8 of 985. It's not going down much. And this is a giant planet. You can still, uh, you can, but you can get such uh, data from the ground. This is a tour de force. And we've been able to do this, as I say, for 70 objects. Now, this has almost nothing to do with my lecture. This is just a model of a planet with velocity vectors that said this being irradiated from the side. A transiting planet is frequently very close to its central star, anomalously so. The sun and the Earth are separated by a distance called the astronomical unit, one. These are frequently 20 times closer. And if they're that close, they're being irradiated quite severely. Now, a transiting planet, as they say, can uh, have its radius measured. Why is that important? One of the major reasons is a giant planet like Jupiter has a Jupiter radius. And that's, it, it's, uh, you get a radius like that only if it's mo made up of mostly hydrogen, a light thing. If the same mass object, and you get the mass from radial velocity, that wobble of uh, the radar gun effect, if that same mass object is made up of heavy elements, oxygen, silicon, magnesium, you know, rock. And it's very much smaller. So from the dip itself, you immediately get what the thing is made of. OK? Now, these are examples of some of the radii that have actually been measured. This is in units of Jupiter's radius. Remember, Jupiter's radius is 10 times the radius of the Earth. Here's Jupiter. Hopefully, it's right at 1. Then there's Saturn, Neptune. You see we have the, almost the whole range here. Some are very hot. And they seem to be inflated by some process. Some are massive. This is 10 times Jupiter's mass. And some are probably made of ice and rock. In our lifetimes, we've discovered planets that are made of things like our planet. That's rather amazing. And it's going to get better. 
Now, of course, astronomers like to name things. They don't use really fancy names, so XO3, GJ436B, hat P11B. I'll, I'll mention a few of these. Uh, don't be put off too much, but if you are, well, too bad. <laughs> now, when you do these transits, you frequently are doing it at a particular wavelength. You can do this, though, as a function of wavelength. The, you, the planet has an atmosphere. If the atmosphere is opaque in one wavelength and transparent in another, the planet looks smaller. Does that make sense? Because the apparent size of the planet is smaller. And so if you can look at the size of the planet as a function of wavelength, you can get another indication of composition. And that's what these people did. Again, with the Hubble Space Telescope, this may not look like a lot. That's a little bit of a dip. This is sort of associated with the uh, size of the planet as a function of wavelength. This is in the optical. That's the sodium line, so-called sodium D line in the, in the yellow. That dip right there is significant enough to indicate that we've caught sodium in the atmosphere of this planet. Now, why is that interesting? Sodium is interesting, uh, but the major reason is this is the first measurement of the composition of any planet outside the solar system. These numbers. Now, you can do this as a function of wavelength. This is in the optical, and this is in the infrared. And because, for the same reasons I mentioned before, the planet looks different at different wavelengths. You can see a variation in the apparent size of the planet in principle, and people have pursued this. But those variations are diagnostic of not only sodium, but the presence of water, or carbon monoxide, or carbon dioxide, whatever else is there. And so that's an independent way of getting a spectrum of the planet without even seeing the light. You're still seeing the light of the star. Now, here's some statistics and facts. They are everywhere. If you look up in the night sky, this is uh, not a very good diagram. Look up in the night sky. There's Polaris. Um, I be, yeah, better be. Okay. Um, there, there are a variety of uh, common constellations. And you should do this after this lecture. There are a number of objects. There's one 55 Cancri in the Cancer, uh, 70 Virgins. Upsilon, uh, there's uh, 47 Ursa Majoris. It's in the Big Dipper. Botes, Andromeda, Cygnus, Pegasus. 51 Pegasi was the first one discovered by that radial velocity technique, and it's right there. So remember this map, and when you go outside, you can go check it out. <laughs> They're all looking down at you. You might as well look up. Now, in a number of these systems, we've discovered not just one planet, not just two, not just three, but four. And there are probably more. This is an example. It was early discovered. And this is sort of the relative distances. The, um, this one is about 16 times closer to its star than the Earth is to the sun. This is sort of at the distance of uh, the Earth. This is uh, at the distance of the asteroid belt, but around its own star, of course. And this is for comparison. Oh, this is a cheesy movie. Um, Upsilon Andromeda system, but it gives you a sense of rapidly rotating inner one, these planetary systems we've discovered. Now, this is the last time such a diagram could be put together with a reasonable font. This is actually just the name of the planet <laughs> versus the distance from its star. There are a lot of them. All these are multiples. Multiple planets. And again, we're tripping over the big ones. There are probably lots of small ones. This is also a diagram of the mass of the planet. This is in units of Jupiter mass. So there's some big ones here. There's one Jupiter there, five Jupiters, 10 Jupiters. And this is a, the distance of the planet from the star. That's the Earth's distance. That's Jupiter's distance itself. And this is some of what we've discovered. Remember, I said we discovered 500 of these things. Can't really fit them on very well. These are discovered by the radio velocity technique. There are these that are really close that were discovered by the transiting technique where the planet occults the star, and the diminution of the light of the star is a signature of the planet and gives us information about the radius. And these are some of the more interesting. Now, I want to mention a, a couple of exotic objects. Well, maybe one. This one is a planet that was discovered in an orbit around a nearby star. The 
orbit of the planet is about 111 days. Now, not 365 and a quarter. It's about 111 plus days. So it's far out there, but not as far as the uh, Earth is around the sun. But the Earth doesn't rotate in anything but a circle. There's a little bit of an eccentricity. The eccentricity of this planet is huge. It gets close, it goes far. It gets close, it goes far. Now, what would happen to the Earth if the Earth's orbit were something like this? You fry, you freeze. You fry, you freeze. The, ra the ratio of the insulation, the ra irradiation on the planet right here, closest approach and far away, is almost 900. This is going to get flashed. So it's not a place you want to live or you don't want to live on a moon around this either. This is actually a giant planet. But it's a rather exotic object. Now, one of the reasons it's exotic, this is, these are, look like terrible data. And to a theorist, they are terrible data. But to an observer, they're wonderful. Now, you, you can't really tell much from this. But I will tell you that they're actually seeing the transit there, that dip. And the slope is not zero. That doesn't look obvious, but it's, it's statistically true. It, if it were in a circular orbit and very simple, it would be like this. Because of that slope there, what that's indicating is that as the planet approaches, it's being fried. And as it moves away, it's still hot. And there's a delay in its cooling. And so you can actually see the hysteresis, in some sense, of the flashing of the planet. It's not instantaneous. It heats, it responds, and cools on some time scale. And that time scale is diagnostic of the atmosphere. Just from that time, you could figure out something about the atmosphere. Now, this is a, a map, again, of mass. Here's the Earth. This is one is Earth now. Jupiter is about 300, as I said before. Saturn is down here. Neptune is down here. Here are a number of objects discovered by just one team in Geneva. The first one that was unambiguously discovered was that object in Pegasus, 51 Peg. And that was the year, 1995. There's a whole story. There, there was a, an interesting story there. Since then, they've discovered quite a few. But you notice something. Well, this is a new instrument that the, discovered, uh, the, the red objects were discovered by that instrument. But notice something. Look at the envelope of that. They're getting better and better. Earth is right there. So if you extrapolate, 2011, mark your calendars. <laughs> now, this is just examples of the radio velocity application. It looks a little bit noisy, but this is gold to an astronomer. Um, but you read these data, and what you infer are what are called super-Earths. The objects are on the order of four Earth masses. Remember, Jupiter is 318 Earth masses. These are getting within spitting distance, pardon my French, of Earth mass. So we're really getting fairly close. And these also are no doubt rocks, or ice rock mixtures, or hydrogen, ice, and rock. But a good fraction are going to be like the silicate in our Earth, the iron and silicate in our Earth. There is one star around which there are a number of very low mass objects. But look at this one. That's two Earth masses. Nobody thought 15 years ago that we'd be getting such data so soon. Again, one of my favorite diagrams, mass versus distance. This is a tenth of the distance between the Earth and the Sun, the distance between the Earth and the Sun, 10 times the distance between the Earth and the Sun. That's sort of a Saturn distance to the Sun. This is a scattering of objects that have been discovered by the transit technique uh, and by the radial velocity technique. But you'd see we're, we're starting to discover way down here. Earth is right there. That's E. Now, to get the radial velocity technique to discover Earth around a solar-like star requires not a velocity of this, not a velocity of this for the wobble of the star, but 10 centimeters a second. That's small. You can't walk that slow. 27 meters a second is 60 miles an hour. So 27 meters a second, this is 10 centimeters a second. And that's the signature that people are looking for. OK? Now, predictions are easy. Um, 
Here's Earth masses. This is a prediction for how many planets there may be. A lot of Jupiters. Remember, 300 is Jupiter in these units. That's the Earth one. Then they expect some Neptunes, and then this is what they expect in the Earth range. Maybe. We've seen the giant planets. We've seen so-called super-Earths, sort of Neptunes and Earth objects. And these are the predictions. This is mass versus distance again, my favorite diagram. You start out with, the, in theory, some planets with very small masses, and you allow them to accumulate. And then their orbits change, and you do all these calculations. And this is what people predict. They predict a lot of big ones that are moving in. So notice they're migrating in. But there are a lot that are way out here. There's a whole distribution. But notice something. They predict a gap here. We're not seeing that gap. We're seeing a number of planets starting to fill this region in here. Theory is good, but it's not great. And it needs to be disciplined by observation. Those observations are coming fast and furious. So various techniques, as I said, are going to be used to try to beat, go down to the lowest masses. The microlensing technique can go into this regime. Large distances, but low masses. Radio velocity technique from the ground, it could be something from, well, from the ground. Could also do this in principle. This is going to be very hard. And transits from space. So people are actually planning methods of detecting of small objects, Earth-like objects, throughout the entire range of distances between the planet and the star. Now, one of the foremost instruments that's in space now is the Kepler telescope. It was launched uh, very recently. And what it's supposed to do is to stare in a certain part of the sky. These are actually the fields. They're looking in various regions of the sky with big CCD camera, about, I think it's 400 million pixel camera. Yeah. Yeah, it's not the biggest camera being built, but it's the biggest one up there now. Um, and they're going to look for these transits. In space, you can get not just a 1.5% dip, which was still hard enough to see. You can get something that might be a dip of a part in 10, 100,000. And that's what they need for Earth. This whole mission was designed to discover Earths. Now. There is another telescope up there, the Corot satellite, uh, European, it's a French European satellite, Brazilian as well. It does the same thing. Kepler's going to do more. Corot has done a lot. And this is an example. This is so called Corot 7b. There's the transit curve. But look at those numbers 1.9996. They actually measured it. Pretty good. Kepler's going to do better. Now, this is a diagram of radius versus mass, just to put things in some perspective. Here's Jupiter, here's Saturn. And this is in Earth units, so 1 is the radius of the Earth. 10, a little bit more, is the radius of Jupiter. This is where a lot of the Jupiters we've discovered are. Some of them are large, some of them are modest size, but we're down here now. Every one of the, whoops, except for these, these are our planets, that's Earth. Every one of those is a discovery. And there are many more to be announced. And from where they are in this diagram, you can tell what they're made of, approximately. Transit technique. We saw this already. I want to remind you that the planet will go behind the star. And so you can look at the star and the planet together. They're both radiating, and you see the sum light of the two. You can't image them separately. They're too close. But when the planet goes behind the star, this planet's light just all of a sudden goes away. And so from the difference between the star plus planet and star, you can get planet. You can get the photons from the planet in a way that people hadn't really predicted. One of the ways of doing it is with the Spitzer Space Telescope, yellow on yellow. Wonderful. This is the telescope is up there. It's still working. Um, it's an infrared telescope. It's only about a meter aperture, but it's great. There's going to be another one that's going to be up there in 2014. It's called the James Webb Space Telescope, another infrared telescope. It's not going to have a 0.85 meter aperture, approximately one. It's going to have a 6.5 meter aperture. If this thing can do what it's already been able to show it can do, you can imagine what JWST, the James Webb Space Telescope, will be able to do. 
I couldn't resist putting some of my own data and my own theory on here. So with these secondary eclipse measurements, you can actually get what the planet star flux ratio is in various wavelengths. Here's the optical down here. Most of it's in the infrared. This is so-called 10 microns in wavelength, where the optical is at about 0.5 microns. So this is a factor of 20 from the optical. But there's a lot of photons coming in the infrared. The data are these points here. The theory is OK. But look at that, those black points. We actually got a spectrum of the planet, not just light in a big, broad bucket of, of, wave, of wavelength, but actually in some detail. Not too much detail, but precious. And that shape right there, and th this shape right here, is a direct signature of water. We've been able to discover water on these planets. You can also say something about carbon monoxide, etc. And I'm going to skip this. But one thing that's important is these planets that are in proximity to their central stars are not only transiting, they're hot. The temperatures are on the order of 2,000 Kelvin. Anybody know what Kelvin is? <laughs> A lot more Fahrenheit. <laughs> so it's going to be way above the melting point of anything you know about. Very, very hot. An oven, for example, would be about 300, 400, 500, 600 Kelvin. This is 2,000. Melting point of lead is 6, 700 Kelvin. I bet. No. We'll pretend that's true. <laughs> OK. Now, people have always wanted to do direct imaging of planets. What they wanted to see was the star and the planet off to the side. They wanted to see the planetary system. They wanted to get an image. In the process of trying to develop the technology to do that, we got all the stuff I just showed you. Completely different techniques. Completely unanticipated. A characteristic of real science. You know, life is what happenings, it happens when you plan, well, while you're planning, right? But people have been able to, uh, let me see if I want to show you this. Eh. Planet star flux ratios. Details, don't worry. But I want to show you a number. You put a planet um, about four times further away than those transiting planets, and you get a spectrum that might look like this. And the only thing I want to call your attention to, it's wavelength dependent. Here's the optical. Here's the infrared. But look at those numbers. If you read logarithms, that says this is a part in 10 to the 4. That's a part in a million. That's 10 parts, a part in 10 billion. In order to see the planet, depending on what its distance is, if it's far away, it's going to be dim, you have to get these types of contrast ratios between the planet and the star. Now, why should that be so difficult? Planet over here, star over here. You should be able to separate them out. In a telescope, it's really tough. The star's light scatters everywhere. And it's the big boss. It's very, very bright by this amount. You have to suppress the light of the star in order to see the planet. That's tough. And you have to do it to, for some of these things in the optical by 10 orders of magnitude. One ten billionth. Nobody can do that. But in the infrared, we got the data I showed you. The numbers are much better. CIA is not Central Intelligence Agency. It's actually a certain process. So don't worry about that, I think. <laughs> now, another thing, again, some science I want to show you, is as you move the planet closer in, the planet gets hotter. And this is, what uh, this is what's being demonstrated here. This is temperature and this is pressure. This is sort of altitude. And as you go further in, temperatures rise. Here's the melting point of lead. Here's the close to that temperature of, uh, that I mentioned before for some of these transiting planets. Very, very high. But notice something. You go further away, you get cooler, 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 until you hit this line here, H2O. What that says is the planet is getting, the atmosphere is getting cold enough that you start forming water clouds. You get further out, it's cold enough to form ammonia clouds. Now, anybody know any object that has ammonia clouds in it? Jupiter. Jupiter's clouds, all those clouds you see are ammonia clouds because of the low temperature. You go a little bit closer, you get water clouds. And we, in principle, will see signatures of clouds in planets around other stars in the next few years. That's something. 
Now, again, people have been trying to get these images, do this imaging, and they have to suppress the light of the star. They haven't been able to do it to great accuracy. Just to show you how desperate people are, they are really excited about this. See that little dim point of light? Here's the star. It's been occulted by a mask. They did some fancy technology to try to minimize the star's effect. They couldn't do it completely. That's actually a ring of dust around the star. That had been known about before. But that is a planet. Now, it's near the ring. The planet is there, and it seems to be sculpting the ring in its orbit. There's an interaction between the ring and the planet. And when we had the ring, it was predicted there was a planet. And they've discovered it. Now, this is not that convincing. But if you watch it over time, you know, this could have been just some sort of zoo event, a cosmic ray, or it could have been anything in the, in the detectors. But if you watch it over time, you see it move. And you see it move at the right speed. Kepler's laws. If it's at a certain distance around a certain star, it's going to be going a certain velocity with a certain period. It's doing that. That's a, good, that's a smoking gun. Now, as I said, this is a tough business. Can you spot the planet? There are three. But they're not easy to see. The star is there, and you can see they've, they've gone to some effort to suppress it. These planets have been discovered at distances that are much further than Jupiter is from the sun, than the Earth is from the sun. Again, the distance between the Earth and the sun is one astronomical unit. This is 24, 38, 68 approximately. These have also been measured to be orbiting with Keplerian velocities. That's something. They also have spectra. I was going to show a spectrum, but take my word for it. They've gotten spectra of, the, uh, of a couple of these objects and uh, constraints on the fluxes from these objects, not just points of light in one band, hard one, but uh, in many different bands. And they're trying to interpret the results. These are the first unambiguous images of a planetary system outside of our own. And it was only two years ago. Now, a little bit more numbers. This is contrast ratio between the star and the planet. Remember I said a part in a billion or 10 billion. This is a part in a thousand, a part in a million, a part in a billion. And this is the capability of some of the instruments that are being developed. Right now, we're over here from the ground. This is mostly from the ground. This is all from the ground. And you can see, maybe we can get to a part in 10 a million, a part in 10 to the 6. Maybe, this is really ambitious, a part in uh, 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 100 million. These are objects, and they're brightnesses. I'm not going to look at the details here, but in principle, with these things, we might be able to see a few Jupiter mass object that's old, that's cooled off a fair amount. Now, Jupiter mass isn't that exciting. But 10 to the minus 8 is what we can do at best. It's going to be a long time before we can image an Earth in such orbits. But that's one of the goals. This is the same type of diagram, but it has a, a more extended range. Instead of 10 to the minus 11, 10 to the minus 9 is 10 to the minus 11. This is what's necessary. This is what we can do. This is logarithmic. This is a challenge. Now, people would like to get this, right? You want to get an image of the Earth and see the variation. You want to see the climate. You want to see the clouds. You want to see the Earth, uh, the um, land. You want to see the ocean, all these sorts of things. Forget it. It's not going to happen anytime soon. But what we might be able to do is the following. An Earth around a, uh, a, a star, like the sun, for example, but there are many types of stars, will have a spectral signature. If you look back at the Earth, what do you see? If you just integrate over the disk of the Earth, you just add up everything and you can't resolve it, what do you see? You see spectral features. 
you'll see some temporal variability because it's rotating and the clouds are coming in and out. And so you're going to see some wobbling a little bit in the emissions. But the thing you really want to look for is the spectrum. Each molecule, each atom has a characteristic spectrum. It says, it says that's me. People know how helium was first discovered? You know too much. Yes, helium, helios, gave the name to helium because it was discovered in the, in the sun before it was discovered on Earth. Its, okay. its spectrum gave it away. For the Earth, you see oxygen. You see water. You see ozone. You see CO2. It's been in the news recently. Oxygen is a non-equilibrium species. It isn't natural. It seems to require, in these abundances, life. You see oxygen features that are strong. Hmm, that might be interesting. You start pointing radio telescopes. So it's these types of signatures that you'd like to look for. This is a comparison of what the planets look like. Here's Venus, Earth, and Mars. Venus has a very strong CO2 atmosphere and no, no ozone, no water to speak of. Earth, water, ozone, CO2. And this is in the infrared. If you look in the optical, it actually shows significant oxygen features and more ozone features, right? Ozone in the near and ultraviolet has to be there because that's what's protecting us. So that absorption can be seen. Mars, CO2 again. So we should be able to distinguish that from that and that using the spectrum. It's going to be hard. One of the things we want to do, as I say, is to detect an Earth-like planet around maybe a solar type star, but in the so-called habitable zone. The habitable zone is defined, for lack of any other reason, as the region where the surface of a planet would have a temperature which is conducive to the existence of liquid water. We think liquid water is important for life. It's certainly important for us. By extrapolation, we really don't know. But maybe liquid, certainly liquid water. And water is pretty abundant in the universe. The habitable zone around a star is at different distances. If you're around a bright star, you've got to get far back. Because if you're too close, you're going to boil. If you're around a dim star, you've got to get closer. So the habitable zone moves in in radius. Around a really small star, it might be 10 times closer than the Earth is to the sun. That's where we look. And there's a project right now to look for Earths around really small stars. And it's easier than looking around big stars, because the big star is a problem. So that, that you might also hear about in 2011. This is where we are, the interesting bit. Okay. So people are looking in this band. Now, I'm going to show some more data. When the planet moves around its source of light, you see phases. There are phases of Venus. There's the phases of the moon. To prove it, here's the moon. Well, I better show that again. There you go. There's the moon. Now, the phase information is fairly useful. Just as an aside, this is a phase curve as a function of angle, the phase. Uh, 180 degrees is new moon. Zero degrees is full moon. This is the moon itself, that gray curve. That's measured. One is as bright as it can get. Notice what happens at 90 degrees. That's just half moon. At half moon, it's only 10% of what it could be. The eye doesn't think that, but that's what it is. It look, doesn't look like 10%, but the eye is, has, it, it responds logarithmically. You change things by a factor of 10, and then another factor of 10, the difference in brightness between that first factor of 10 and the second factor of 10 is the same. Which is bizarre, but that's how you can see really bright things and really dim things with your peepers. Phase curve will tell you what the atmosphere is made of as well. It'll tell you how it scatters. And different objects, such as Jupiter, Uranus, Venus, Mars, etc., have their phase curves like this. We'd like to be able to see that. So with these giant planets in transit, you can watch the summed light of the planet and the star change. I said, remember, when it was in secondary eclipse, 
The, star, the planet was completely occulted. That's the biggest effect, the biggest change. But when it's not occulted, it, the light varies from the planet because of the angle. And so the sum light is varying. You can, in principle, measure that phase curve. And so here's an example. This is versus time. Here's the transit. That's when it comes in front. The sum light goes down by a fairly large amount. Then it goes back up because the star is now completely revealed. But look at that curve. That is the planet. Now this is theory. I haven't showed you data yet. And then it goes behind, the planet goes behind the star, and you get this little dump. That is the planet. This is the occultation by the planet of the star, a big effect. And this is the occultation by the star of the planet, a small effect. We can measure both of them. These are data. This is, well, it's normalized in a certain way, but you can see those two phases. And from that slope, you can measure a curve. It's not a good one but you can measure a phase light curve. Now, you can actually invert those data to get an idea of what the planet looks like and whether there's variation in the emissions from the surface. Is there a hot spot on the planet? Now, you may expect that the substellar point right over the, the, the planet is going to be the hot spot. That could be the case. Well, this is, and this is the map that you infer from these light curves. You actually do infer on this particular planet, which is called HD 189733b, there'll be a test afterwards. You can actually infer where the hot spot is in phase on the surface of the planet. Now, this is an artist rendering. You can't really tell pole to equator differences. This is uh, license. But you can tell the longitudinal dependence, and you can actually see whether the hot spot has shifted. Well, why is that significant? If the hot spot is shifted, you can imagine, you heat the planet. If the planet has winds, the planet's winds will advect that hot spot, and then it'll re-radiate. But it'll re-radiate downstream. And so the displacement tells you, if you measure it well, that you're seeing weather. You're seeing climate on the planet. That's cute. These are the same data. Let me see. And this is the type of thing you might see as a function of phase. This is the planet star flux ratio. Notice this is three thousandths, one thousandth. These are small numbers. These are measurements at secondary eclipse. And this is what you might expect theoretically as a function of phase, as it goes around in its orbit. Day, night, day, night, day, night. These can be measured. And that's what they measured here. That's what they measured, whoops, here. And we're going to do this for many more planets, maybe 20. Now, this is a theoretical rendering of what the planet's surface may look like. This is a giant planet. But this is in a certain band in the near infrared. Here's where the hot spot is. There are cooler areas, etc. We can actually start modeling. The models are pretty sophisticated, more sophisticated than is justified by the data. <laughs> but eventually, we'll be able to make the correspondence between theory and observation. That's my surmise. But you can see there's interesting variation over the surface. And we should be able to disentangle this with really good data. For example, with JWST in 2014. This is another such thing in a different wave band where you don't see a hot spot shifted down. It, there's some science involved there. But it's just, I just want to show you, this is cold. This is hot. This is a model for a planet that we actually know exists. This is another such uh, mission. It's very dark on the night side and is bright on the bright side. And then the contributions of the day and the night uh, sides will give you the intermediate phase brightnesses. Oh, this is another one. This is sort of cute. This is the composition of the surface in theory. This is methane. In theory, you can calculate what the methane distribution in a three-dimensional planet is. These models were um, calculated using general circulation models that are similar to those that are applied to understanding the Earth's climate. You apply the same things where you want to find weather on the Earth and understand it, which is a very difficult job, to these types of objects to try to get a three-dimensional picture. 
And it is driving a lot of the observation in the sense that people really would want to see some signatures of these things. Methane, yes, methane, no. Methane, yes, methane, no. And, and how it's advected in phase. Oh, I just like these movies too much. <laughs> this is no methane for one particular model. And this is a lot of methane. And you can see the difference. That is the Terminator, which is the day-night line. You've all been touched by the Terminator. The future. What does the future hold? I hope I've been able to convince you that the future is very, very bright. There are a lot of people jumping into this field. It's an international effort. Um, it's exciting lots of young folk. Um, there are many missions planned. This is examples of a timeline, perhaps. It may not be followed, but this is just to give you a sense. Corot, this is actually a little bit earlier than the Corot was actually launched. Same with Kepler, but Corot and Kepler are up there. JWST is going to be up there um, fairly soon. There's a mission to actually look at the wobble of stars. They won't be able to see the wobble of an Earth, but they'll be able to look at a billion stars. SIM, that's the Space Interferometry Mission. It may or may not fly, but it's been developed for many, many years. And it's a tour de force, a technological tour de force, to see that astrometric wobble, that thousandth of an arc second. One of the goals is TPF. TPF is a terrestrial planet finder. That's the thing that will give you the part in 10 billion contrast. It's expensive. And then on the ground, there are big telescopes being made that will uh, be able to provide you with complementary information. The large binocular telescope is two 8.5 meter telescopes right next to one another in binocular configuration that exists now in Arizona. The GMT and the TMT will be 30 meter equivalent telescopes. The ELT, the European Large Telescope, may be 42 meters across. Remember, Spitzer was 0.85 meters across. This may be built. One of these, maybe both will be built. This is already built. And they are being built in no small measure to actually look at planets. Many other things as well. They're going to be wonderful for all sorts of things. But some of the motivation is actually to be able to capture the light of planets. This is what JWST looks like in principle. It's a very large aperture. It has a sun shield. It can't point towards the sun. It's an infrared telescope. It has to be as far away from the Earth and the sun as they can make it. But this is going to, this is being built. It's being funded. Uh, as I say, 2014 is the uh, ostensible launch date. And it's going to be the premier follow-on to the Hubble Space Telescope. Any questions? Thank you very much for your patience. <laughs> Well, I'm sure we all got a sense of the excitement of this field and the rapid progress. And I'm sure there are, as usual, many questions. Um, so wait for a mic. And uh, we can start here. These images that you had that showed these patterns that on the whole surface, mm -hmm. is that real that you could get patterns? There's, there's going to be patterning like that on the surfaces of these planets. That's certainly true. The weather, the dynamical weather, is going to do that. And, and exactly whether to... those, those patterns are what those planets will evince is, is not so clear. No, no, what I mean is are, are the technology in the coming couple of decades can actually... You'll be able to that. invert a lot of that indirectly. You won't be able to image it. But you'll be able to get these detailed light curves as a function of wavelength that allow you to back out some of the temperature variation with latitude and longitude, yes. It's going to be tough, but it's doable. It's a matter of getting a lot of data and then getting a good model and then finding the match between the two. And there's going to be temporal variation as well. You'll be watching this, and it's going to flicker. And that also has lots of information in it. I presume most of these are in our own galaxy. What is, what is the distance to the closest and how Good, far? Yeah. What are the far distances? You're I perforce had to leave out a few numbers, but I'm glad you asked that question. Um, many of these are only about tens of light years away. They're the easy ones. The furthest is maybe about, that we know about is about 3,000 light years away. 
Um, that's still very much interior inside the galaxy, which is 100,000 light years across. Um, there are definitely such systems in other galaxies. We just don't have access to them. Am I correct that you are seeing some objects or inferring the existence of some objects that are sub-Pluto in mass? No, no, oh. no. Um, we are seeing such objects that are sub-Pluto in mass in our solar system, definitely, but not outside the solar system. And we've found hundreds of those that are about Pluto's mass. They just were further away in the and, and Tom Bao caught the one that was the brightest. Uh, I'm told that uh, our planet is anomalously bright in the radar frequencies. And I'm wondering uh, if there were uh, beings on other worlds, whether it's worth looking in the radar frequencies at these exoplanets. People are. And there's a whole tradition of doing this over the last decades, the so-called SETI effort, search for extraterrestrial intelligence. And their, motive, their uh, preferred method is in the radio and radar bands. They're looking, they're listening. Uh, as far as I know, they haven't found anything, despite what Jodie Foster might say. <laughs> well, people know, of course, that the, the Jodie Foster character was based on Jill Tarter, who was the head of the SETI Institute who also coined, well, that's another story. <laughs> but have they focused on, on the, uh, I mean, because now they have targets, right? Yeah, no, 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 the, the, yes, they have, yeah. Uh, not all of them, though, just some of the closer ones. And some of those where there's a hint of a planet, mm -hmm. because for the closest stars, we don't have obvious indications there are planets. There probably are, we just haven't gotten them. But if they do find another signature from a close star, that's going to make some headlines. So, because you could follow it up much, much better. So, even though there aren't planets around some of these, they're looking at those as well. Um, it's the array of, of space telescope on Earth is making a big difference these days, being able to stay in touch with events as they go through periods of time. I noticed that large space arrays is very much in the future on your slide for developing new data. I mean, wouldn't that be a quantum leap in knowledge, and why aren't they uh, planned for sooner? Uh, it would be a quantum leap in budget. <laughs> okay. <laughs> it's that much difference. Um, people can conceive of all sorts of things. Uh, it's just a matter of what the fiscus can allow. I would think that um, those the technologies are going to be further developed, and sometime in the future they'll be able to do it. Um, these arrays are multiple telescopes whose light is being added together, um, not just crudely, but interferometrically, which means that they can do phase information. They can get big, inf they can get very good angular resolution. And that's what you'd want to do to actually pick out the, the dim planet that's near a bright star. And so there's a whole provenance, there's a lot of technology associated with this. It's not going to be done anytime soon. But it will be, the technology will be developed. And they'll try to improve it, improve it, improve it, and prove that they can do it. You're, you're looking for a very, um, for our kind of life form, which is in that land. Now we know that there are life forms near the vents in the ocean that live at high temperature and very high pressures. And uh, uh, I'm wondering if that environment, uh, I wonder if they leave tracks and that you, and, and those kinds of environments might be easier to find than, than what you're question. looking for. And yeah. we may well find that they may leave tracks that you could detect. Yeah. Um, <laughs> the, uh, the life in the hydrothermal vents uh, had to have originated on the land. Or it had to have originated elsewhere. It, they all have the same DNA. Uh, so that there is a consanguinity of all life on Earth even around the hydrothermal vents. They just found evolutionarily a place where they could survive and thrive, even at very high temperatures and pressures. Is it, is it possible for you to see a dark star that is actually a second star of a binary star system, such as 
uh, one that is postulated to be one in our system. Um, I'm not sure what you mean by a dark star. There are stars that have a variety of uh, sizes and luminosities, and some can be pretty dark. In our system, we have lots, in our solar system, we have lots of constraints on the possible presence of such a thing. There isn't anything. There could be something uh, about a Jupiter mass or maybe a little bit more at very large distances in the so-called Oort cloud. And there's been some speculation that there's one orbiting at a uh, 26 million year period. Not one year, 26 million years. There's no evidence for it, except that people suggest that it's on a very eccentric orbit. And when it comes in, it scatters the comets in the Oort cloud, causes them to come in, hit the Earth, cause extinctions, and they think they see in the extinction records a 26 million year periodicity. It's a little controversial and probably wrong. <laughs> but that's the type of thing that there could be that we're missing at that size. And then uh, we have many, many binary stars with very large mass ratios, contrasts. So you can have a very small star around a very big star. And in some sense, that could be a dark star. But uh, those are, in principle, are amenable to direct detection. Most stars are in binaries. And, and most stars are dim. Good question. Um, let me see. Well, let's see if we have a, we have a picture. If I can move this. Whoops. I got extra slides. <laughs> um, there we go. Um, in order to get into space, you have to be light. You can't really loft the classical telescope into space. And so light weighting a mirror is uh, part of the art and the technology. These mirrors are made of beryllium. Now, if anybody knows anything about beryllium, you don't want to have anything to do with it. <laughs> Well, they know how to machine it. It's difficult, but it's poisonous. The, 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 lethal, the lethal dose of beryllium is 43 micrograms. And it does terrible things to your lungs when you breathe it in. And there are very many EPA restrictions on its use. It's used for all sorts of things, including nuclear weapons. But that's a different subject. But you see that the mirror is fairly thin. And I think that thinness is on the order of six inches, a little bit less. And for comparison, you get mirrors that are this thick in big telescopes on the ground made of glass. And one of the new things that people have done with the new technologies is actually lightweight those mirrors by making honeycombs. So you have a big, fat mirror, then you drill out a lot of the glass until you get to the surface. It makes it much lighter. It also allows you to cool off the mirror and to keep it at a constant temperature because the variation in the temperature over the surface of a mirror causes flexure, just expansion, right? And if it expands differentially, or if you can't control that temperature, you start getting wobbly images. That's not good. And so the technology of mirrors has progressed beyond the Palomar telescope, which was the state of the art, the 200-inch, 5-meter telescope that's on Mount Palomar. But that telescope was a dinosaur technologically compared to what they need to do. And for anything in space, they have to lightweight the mirrors. And they're pushing really hard to do that. And this is an example of that. It still weighs a lot, but they can launch it. They can't launch Palomar. What is the size? Uh, 6.5 meters across. And if you saw the movie that was up there before, there's no rocket that they have that could launch a 6.5 meter mirror. It's too big uh, for anything that we have. And so what they do, you see the honeycomb, they fold it, and it unfolds in space. And, and that's, what, that's what that's showing. It'll take some time, so you don't need to dwell on that right now. But this is an example of how it unfolds. The solar panels, they need power. This will take some time, so we can still entertain some questions if there are some. But you can see the unfolding. It's rumored that agencies of the government know how to do this. <laughs> for the really, really small radial velocities that you're going to try to measure from the Earth, do you have to start subtracting out lunar and solar tides and um, any kind of periodicity caused by it being on the Earth and the Earth flexing and moving? And 
No, we, we, can, we can subtract that out very easily. It's not a problem. Because it's periodic? Uh, no, from space it's not such a big deal. The gravitational effects aren't very large. Um, well, I just meant Earth-based. If, if you've got a, the... That's that, okay. temperature control, good guiding. Uh, that's not a problem. Things move together. It's, it's, if, we, it, it's, it's if the mirror flexes internally that you have troubles. Okay. Well, I was just thinking, you know, that you've, the flex is something like a meter for lunar tides. It's on, okay. On, on, it's okay. okay. That's up and down. That's not inside the telescope. That's, that's okay. And, and they also have adaptive optics techniques, which actually jiggle the mirror to cancel out the atmosphere effects, which is the bigger effect. And so the atmosphere scintillation comes in, and you get all these speckles. And you could actually cancel those speckles out by having actuators at the bottom of the mirror that work at, at kilohertz frequencies to, to actually cancel out the atmosphere. That's a new technology in the last 20 years. OK, uh, I think. Uh, that we should wrap up and have and proceed to the comments room where there are refreshments and you can continue to look to Adam and let's thank him again for a really exciting lecture.